I'm going to introduce you now, and uh, then after my brief introduction, you'll you'll speak for about for however long you'd like to, 30, 40 minutes. We'll take some questions from the audience. At the end, if you have questions, there's the Q&A field in the bottom of your screen. Please enter them there. I'll relay them to Gray at the end. Um, introducing you, Gray, is, is an, another unusual challenge because you have a different background from many of the CEO types that we, we invite. Um, and also, it's, it's, you have like the longest <laughs> CV <laughs> and such an interesting one, too. So, you know, what's very striking is uh, to me is your experience in foreign policy. So I'll just read out a little bit of your bio, which if you're interested, you can see on the Oxitec website. Um, before and after September 11, 2001, Gray served in the U.S. government in a range of leadership roles in conflicts and post-conflict stabilization operations around the world. Gray served in dozens of countries, primarily in Africa. Um, Gray then served on the senior staff of two U.S. secretaries of state as the first chief of staff of the U.S. government's Office of Stabilization Operations. I could go on, um, but that's not the, you know, that's just starting in 2001. And, and you know, you've got previous experience as uh, leading a biotech company in, in uh, sort of mosquito vector control type operations. By the way, this is Gray Franson, CEO of Oxitec. I did not mention that. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you, Gray, to, to introduce your, your colleagues um, who are also on this call. And I'll, I'll reappear at the end of your talk to conduct the Q&A. So over to you. Okay, super. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us. Uh, again, real privilege to be, to be talking with the group today. Um, I will zip through the, the presentation so that we can get to a good, authentic dialogue and, and conversation with those who are participating. And um, we're an open book, so we'll, we'll be happy to take that conversation anywhere we go. I am thankfully joined by Meredith Fensum, who is the head of Oxitex Global Public Affairs. And I'm thrilled to have her along with us today. She um, is responsible for all of our public engagement efforts worldwide. And I thought would be a, an excellent contributor to this conversation as we think um, later about some of the topics you already talked about, and that is um, moving a complicated and yet exceptionally um, uh, uh, powerful technology um, into the human space, right? Out of the labs and into the place where it can have an impact. And that's where we, we hope to, to drive the conversation today. I think it'd be really fun. Uh, so thanks again. Um, let's get started. And um, I have the Q&A window open here. I'll, I'll probably ignore it as we go through the slides, but um, for those of you uh, watching slash listening, um, Feel free. Let's let's throw some questions in there, and I look forward to having a good a good conversation. Okay, let's um, let's bring up the slides and uh, let's get to work. So, uh, first, um, this is Oxitech. We are a UK-based biotechnology company, and we are owned by uh, um, we are U.S. owned. And as you can sense I am an American, as is Meredith, but we have a team comprised of indi uh, individuals from 15 countries, uh, which we're really, really proud of. Um, I'm reporting live to you from Oxford in the UK, and Meredith is in Washington, DC today. Um, next slide. Um, I just like showing fun pictures of insects, um, although today's uh, conversation is going to be about humans. Um, we develop um, basically genetically modified insects to help combat um, uh, vectors, uh, you know, mosquitoes that transmit diseases and insect uh, pests that destroy crops. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail. But that's what we do. We engineer insects um, in a safe, sustainable, non-toxic way um, for their deployment in the real world where they can help um, solve a couple of big challenges that we're facing worldwide. Next slide, please. Quick picture, um, we've got a couple of our staff members, Catherine on the left and Felipe on the right. That's in a, a field in Brazil. And um, I, I like to highlight the fact that our mission uh, is to improve lives and livelihoods. That's what this organization is about. Everything we do is focused on developing technologies to pursue this mission. Probably not unlike what you would hear a normal CEO say, uh, but in this case, um, our mission and our our values really um, drive our behaviors on a daily basis, and I'll talk about that. 
2002 is when we were started in Oxford University, just up the street from me, and an incredibly smart group of people got together and, and figured out that if we could insert uh, a, few diff a few genes, two in particular, uh, into insects, um, we could create self-limiting insects with no other adjustment to the insect itself. Um, and by inserting two safe genes, um, we could manipulate um, how uh, successful they are in the mating process or how successfully their progeny uh, come through the mating process when one of our insects is mated with a wild type female insect. And I'll go through more of that later. But the bottom line is we've been doing this for a long time. And um, I'm just one of a, a great group of people and uh, one part of a long legacy of excellence that this organization has developed. And uh, we'll get into that uh, as well next. Um, I said, um, certainly humans plus insects equals love. This is definitely um, what we as a company focus on. Um, when you tell somebody you're developing a genetically modified insect, um, the response to that sometimes is one of amusement, uh, curiosity, and even sometimes a bit of uh, skepticism or concern. Um, and since I took over as CEO, our, 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 we really shifted how we engage with uh, the public and um, where we emphasize our work as it relates to uh, engendering trust with those we seek to serve and with uh, those whom we wish to serve. Um, so again, we'll, we'll talk through this, but I did wanna share with everybody that I'm, I'm less in interested in talking about insects today than I am about uh, humans and the human element to ensuring a technology like ours is scalable um, and uh, capable of having the impact uh, that it promises. The next slide, please. So, you know, the, the context for a company like ours, um, we're doing some really great stuff, uh, but, um, you know, why and how does that fit into the larger global picture? These, these things are not news for you, but I, I thought I'd just shape them in, in context of what we do. So we develop both mosquito technologies and agricultural pests, and you'll see a list coming up soon. But for the mosquito a category. We're developing self-limiting mosquitoes that, that target specific disease vectors. And in the case uh, of today's discussion, the vector of dengue, Zika, chikungunya, yellow fever, called Aedes aegypti, and um, two malaria vectors. And the global challenge is not getting better. Um, we're developing these technologies in in the context of an increasing burden of vector-borne diseases worldwide. Um, and in the context of the current set of tools to combat these insects failing. So as climate changes, um, the geographic area to which these insects can travel is expanding, which means the disease risk area is expanding. And the tools we have to fight them are failing or becoming increasingly um, um, uh, ineffective in, in combating them. And thus, uh, we have a major, major challenge globally um, as our climate continues to change. Likewise, on the, on the food security front, similar dynamics as the, as the climate changes uh, and as our human population grows, food security is critical. Don't need to tell you that. Um, but most people don't understand just how impactful uh, insects are on food security and how damaging they are becoming, uh, especially as they uh, evolve more rapidly than we can develop new tools uh, to counter. Um, and in the case of, of agriculture, it is you know, widely known that um, you know, BT crops uh, work very well for a period of time against certain target pests, um, but it's also known that, they, um, that insects can generate resistance to uh, BT crops or GMO crops uh, in another phrase. So what do we do? Uh, we need, we have more humans to feed. We have only a set number of acres that we can farm as, um, uh, productively and safely, and uh, yet insects continue to out-engineer us. And, and that's the context of, of the work we do. So when we wake up in the morning, we look at these two major, um, you know, kind of global challenge buckets, so to speak, and, uh, and we get to work. So next slide, please. Let's zero in a little bit on the, on the mosquito front. Most people know the headlines that uh, malaria is deadly, that dengue continues to, to, to ravage uh, major parts of the human population. Um, but few people understand the trend lines or, or take time to understand them. 
Um, and that is that the malaria, the progress against malaria over the last few decades has been pretty significant um, in, in part due to new tools that were introduced, uh, insecticide embedded bed nets, for example, being a, a major one, um, and uh, simple kind of um, um, approaches like indoor residual spraying combined with mass drug administration. Lots of great combinations have gotten the malaria burden down. Um, it, However, the last couple of years, the, the, that's changing. And we've seen a stalling of progress on the malaria front, um, largely because um, we, have, we have yet to be able to, to, to kind of control the vector and get this under control. Mosquitoes are, are uh, out evolving um, active ingredients in the pesticides that are used in indoor residual spraying and uh, for the pesticides or the insecticides used in bed nets. And that's a scary prospect uh, because it takes a lot of time and effort to develop new chemical ingredients um, or new uh, bed nets that, that can be deployed uh, uh, universally in, in the places that need them. And uh, we, we think that this is kind of a, a really unsatisfactory um, set of responses to what now will soon be another growing uh, public health crisis around the world. Dengue, similar, uh, and yet the trend lines continue to go up in part because the disease vector, this mosquito that I mentioned, um, continues to spread uh, geographically around the world. So it's taking the disease burden and the disease potential into new uh, and, and farther territories. Uh, in the US, for example, um, if we had a map, you can see that Aedes aegypti is, continues to march northward um, and, um, and now poses a threat to large and larger portions of the US population. Still then, insecticides are not working and traditional tools are, are incapable of stopping this particular insect. There is no vaccine uh, for, for either malaria or for dengue and um, we don't see one on the, in the foreseeable future, although we, we hope a, a number of smart groups are successful in their efforts. If you layer COVID in across all of these uh, activities, we have problems with the headlines and the trend lines. And um, we can talk later, of course, if you're interested about uh, the impact that we see COVID having uh, on this front. But I, I did want to set the scene here on the mosquito um, stage. Let's go to the next one. I'll be slightly more, uh, slightly briefer on this one, but likewise on the food security uh, front. Um, massive levels of, of destruction that insects um, place on economic productivity around food. Um, and in countries that are um, already suffering from food insecurity, um, either by uh, small farm holders in places in sub-Saharan Africa, or uh, for those who are dependent on affordable and steady food supply, um, insects are a real problem. And uh, I certainly came to this business through the mosquito uh, channel and uh, it has been remarkable for me to, to learn and, and, and grow a, a real sincere interest in this space. Uh, if we don't get new tools onto the market soon enough, there will be real challenges to how we uh, develop um, crops, simple crops like corn and soy, and make, that, uh, make them affordable worldwide in a sustainable fashion. I will say that our team believes chemistry or pesticides are not the answer. Uh, we believe that, that pesticides do play a role in both public health and in food security or agricultural um, arenas, um, but we, we believe they're not the, the, the full solution. And in fact, um, much of what we talk about relating to our technology relates to sustainability and the fact that our technology is self-limiting, so it goes away, it is safe, it is non-toxic, uh, it leaves no impact on the environment, and um, and potentially eliminates or reduces the need for the application of pesticides of the type you, you see these guys uh, deploying on the screen. So um, let's, let's, get, let's get further into the story. Um, next slide, please. Here's Catherine again. Um, those are fall armyworm in that little sphere. They're, they're out in a field trial setting. I love the picture because you can see her intense focus on these little insects. We uh, are very happy that she loves insects more than humans. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll see um, just a brief uh, snapshot of what our technology platform is about. For those who don't know, um, uh, you, you have a few bullet points at the top of the page, um, and I've already mentioned a few, safe and non-toxic. Our technologies are species specific. So if we develop a self-limiting fall armyworm, 
for agricultural purposes. It only pursues uh, the uh, suppression of fall armyworm um, in a given locale. Likewise, on the mosquito front, these are non-allergenic, non-persistent, um, and self-limiting as mentioned. So as we release our insects into the environment for a period of time and in a certain area, they will uh, go to extinction. Our insect will disappear from the environment as will the two genes um, that we've inserted in, uh, in them. Uh, and, and we're really proud of this. It's a, it's a very simple and very elegant technology. It, it's, it's not fancy and yet uh, it holds an incredible amount of promise in our minds. Um, we, we can talk later about Wolbachia, we can talk about gene drive, uh, radiation, and a few other um, techniques that sometimes we're lumped together with um, relating to insect control. Um, but by and large, we, we feel ours is, is a very simple, proven, and, um, and sustainable and scalable approach. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about it here. Next slide. Um, we'll show you just briefly what it's all about. So um, uh, regardless of the insect, um, what, how we develop these insects um, relates to um, the insertion of a self-limiting gene, which is a non-toxic, non-allergenic gene product that is very well known. So we're, we're not the inventors of this. Um, it is inserted into the genome and it finds its home. And that allows us in essence to uh, release male only cohorts into the environment and that self-limiting gene um, is transmitted through a wild type mating to progeny. And the progeny, um, in this case, um, all female progeny will die uh, as a result of the mating between one of our male insects and a wild type female. So all the females for that specific generation then are uh, eliminated and uh, that's good news. The males uh, carry on, they do uh, emerge to adulthood Half of those males uh, carry on um, a self-limiting gene uh, to uh, help perpetuate the effect for a few more generations. Uh, and half of those males are, are normal males in essence um, with clean background genetics that are not susceptible to, uh, that are not resistant, excuse me, to insecticides. So that was a, that was a mouthful. Um, maybe an easy way to say it is we've engineered these to mate with wild females, the progeny of which um, um, turns off the ability for females to uh, emerge as adults, and it allows males to survive, but in a manner that, uh, in a Mendelian manner, uh, that um, continues on a suppression effect for a period of time while introgressing uh, clean background genetics that have been selected for their susceptibility to uh, common insecticides. So hope that was uh, somewhat clear. That was gene one. Gene two is far more simple, and that is a just a marker gene. It's a fluorescent marker so that we can um, look for our insects if we're interested in finding out where they are in the field and how, how well they're doing. We can uh, place our insects uh, under a, mi a certain microscope and, and see which are ours versus wild type. So no adjustment to their behavior whatsoever, just a, a marker gene. Okay, next slide, please. This is what it looks like, uh, you know, illustratively. Um, if we begin releasing our insects, um, then the local targeted population begins to uh, become suppressed, and that's and that's uh, what we want in both uh, the mosquito and the agricultural applications for this technology. Um, but also, as mentioned, and it's increasingly important because, as mentioned, chemistries are losing their effectiveness. Insects are engineering their ways around um, the, the active ingredients on the market today very quickly. Um, we're introducing clean background genetics into uh, the remaining wild type population that we don't suppress, which means they're now and their progeny then would be um, fully susceptible to common tools. So in another way, um, this means that we're suppressing and we're, um, for those that we don't get, we're making them susceptible to the tools that say farmers um, or public health officials are using uh, as a course of their, their normal business and thus extending the value for the tools that, that they're currently using. And for countries or, or, or regions and communities that uh, have very few resources, uh, this can be a really big benefit, especially on the mosquito front um, because there is not an extensive list of tools that, that are available to them. On the agricultural front, this has a big impact on the um, prospect of extending the life of um, biotech crops. Just like normal chemistries, biotech crops um, 
are exceptionally effective, um, but insects like the fall army worm have engineered themselves uh, uh, around the, the insecticidal properties of those crops. Um, and by releasing our, our insects um, in conjunction with the use of, of biotech crops, um, we can generate, uh, we can preserve the value of the BT crop by keeping the local wild type populations susceptible once we've um, had a presence in the area. So it's very exciting, very exciting. So from a tactical level, if we're talking about suppress, suppressing a disease vector, for example, Aedes aegypti or a malaria vector, um, our technology has been demonstrated time and again to be highly, highly effective um, with no residual or um, uh, other, um, you know, kind of side effect, zero side effects. And if you're combining it with other tools, this is a very graceful, very elegant uh, approach to uh, extending the value of others. Okay, let's move on. So is it just us saying this or, um, you know, <laughs> what's the science and, and what is, what is the, uh, the, the kind of peer reviewed community uh, believe? And um, we're very proud to have well over a hundred studies now um, published in, uh, in journals, um, which is great. Here's just a quick couple of uh, screenshots for you. Um, you can go to our website um, for a full list and many of which are, are open access um, for your reading pleasure. Um, but a quick Google search will, will help you recognize the depth of the science um, that has been put into and has been evaluated uh, around this technology. So we're very proud of this, um, this, this validation by our peers. Um, and we're also proud of the, the, the depth of uh, evaluation and, and study relating to our technologies, not just the, the self-limiting components of, the, of, of our insects, but also how they have been used in the field, how effective they've been in the field, um, their safety, uh, et cetera. The good news is all those green check marks continue to be consistent throughout every, uh, every paper that has been published, whether it was by our team or uh, others, which is great news. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so it's not just the academic and scientific community that believes this, the regulators are also uh, favorable to our technology and have been for years um, around the world. And we, we have a few, we have a, a logo wall here that continues to grow. This is just a selection of regulatory agencies we engage with or have given us um, uh, permissions to deploy our mosquitoes. A lot of uh, US um, agencies here in the first row and then a few in the second. Uh, we can talk about our US journey um, later if that's of interest to you, but um, we just recently in this last year uh, received approval uh, for the first time in the US um, to deploy our mosquito technology um, via an experimental use permit, uh, an EUP as it's called by the EPA. And that was a real landmark decision in part because the journey for our mosquito in the regulatory uh, process in the US started in a very different place. We're now, I think the only um, vector control tool that has been evaluated by both the FDA and the EPA. The FDA was um, the agency of record or jurisdiction for us until they weren't. And the jurisdiction shifted um, to the EPA a few years ago. So it's been fun. Um, we, we have lots of lessons um, and Yet, most importantly, we have a lot of appreciation for the work that, that our federal colleagues, um, government colleagues have done to fully evaluate um, our technology. And if you haven't checked it out, and you certainly can see it on our website, taking a quick perusal uh, through our risk assessment published by the EPA about our technology and the application we filed for our Florida trials coming up next year is exhaustive. That It certainly is one of the more exhaustive. Um, uh, risk assessments we've been part of. Um, but thankfully, the EPA is one of just many national and state uh, or regional level um, government agencies and bodies um, that have uh, given us a clean bill of health and have confirmed that our technology is safe, um, that it poses no threat to humans, animals, or the environment, and has no impact on endangered species, et cetera. And uh, we're really proud of this track record. Next, please. Here's a quick snapshot of a bunch of colorful circles that give you a sense of, of where we have been active over the last number of years and um, where we've been able to demonstrate our technologies, um, mostly in, in, in the trial stages. Um, we've been very selective about where we've wanted to commercialize fully, um, but each of these represents a, um, excellent progress on the regulatory front, of course, and um, excellent collaborations with 
um, governments and uh, universities and institutions uh, in each of these. Next, please. I better pick up the pace here. Um, let's talk about mosquitoes real briefly. Um, as mentioned, the story about our company is really about humans. Um, the technology we build is insects, um, but there's a great shot of Natalia, who is our Brazil country director, um, with an early prototype of our second generation 80s Egypti technology. It's a just add water uh, approach. Um, and she's amongst uh, a bunch of kids there that are celebrating the, the, re the, the launch of a field trial. I have never seen this kind of photo for a pesticide company launching a trial for a pesticide. Just keep that in mind. Next is a quick snapshot. This really is the future of 80s Egypti control. Um, so we're, you know, OxyTech is very focused on creating sustainable and scalable solutions. Um, our technology is unique because we are a male selecting technology, thereby allowing us to produce insects at scale without having to sort females out of the process. We used to have to do that with our first generation technology. We've evolved and have improved um, and are taking, um, in essence, what's inside that box. That inside that box is a small capsule that can um, you know, hatch for us 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 mosquitoes, whatever we'd like to come out of that box in a timely fashion uh, with, with a just add water uh, approach, which can be done by anybody. And I, I, I share this with every audience I can, but I think that the real progress we're going to make against uh, vector-borne diseases um, will come from us democratizing the tools um, that are effective in combating those vectors. Big, heavy, top-down, uh, government-controlled programs have a role, um, but I don't think that's the way of the future. I think by empowering communities, um, families, um, small businesses to take action, take part of the fight against dengue, for example, um, we'll see greater progress. Next, please. I'm gonna skip over this. We, we covered the, the, the basic elements of the technology. Here's a quick snapshot of our, our you know, just how long it takes to um, advance these types of technologies um, to market. So we're on the right-hand side now, we're in that green space, what we call second generation. Um, OX5034 is a particular, it's, that's the particular 80s Egypti uh, technology that we're, that we're uh, advancing now. And this is what uh, performance looks like to us, um, which is um, um, relatively easy to understand, of course. Um, it's a simplified version of, of, of data, but we can generate significant suppression of these disease vectors very quickly. That's the key takeaway here and especially in relation to our first generation technology, which was noted um, as, in essence, the, the, a significant advancement and one of the most effective vector control tools um, ever. So we're beating that. And I think this is a, a great um, testimony to the hard work of our team members, but also the really cool components of our second generation technology uh, that I mentioned before. Next, please. Okay, um, just a quick note. Um, there's our friend uh, Wolf Blitzer. And um, just to say that we're really proud of being part of the fight against malaria now. And thanks um, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we are in partnership with them to develop on the next slide, um, two malaria vectors. One of them is Anopheles albomanus. Uh, we're in the process now of developing this insect for deployment in the pursuit of this mosquito that continues to transmit malaria in the Western Hemisphere, in Central America and the Caribbean. Haiti is ground zero for this insect transmitting malaria and it's been a, a tough one to root out. Um, and we all agree that there's, there's no reason that this should continue to transmit malaria in these regions. So we wanna go get it and we're developing the solution to do that. The, the, the more dynamic story is on in the blue. So Anopheles stevensi is a malaria vector that looks more like the 80s Egypti mosquito, an urban dwelling mosquito that likes to live in, in, in crowded urban environments. And the, the challenge with this is that it is thriving in cities um, and especially now spreading uh, in cities um, in the Horn of Africa and, and is traveling south. So this is a real concern um, as it moves kind of west and down the eastern coast of, of the African continent. It is also becoming more fully ingrained in um, the Middle East, South Asia, and is spreading into Southeast Asia. 
it's tough. Um, and it's, it's hard to fight. It's hard to combat a vector that lives in and amongst us, um, and especially in, in highly dense urban environments where vector control uh, capacity is oftentimes anemic at best. So this is where we believe our, our solution is uniquely suited um, to pursue this insect and control it because our Anopheles Stevens eye will indeed um, seek out um, female uh, Stevens eye mosquitoes exactly where they are. So we're using the behavior of the insect in essence to, to provide targeted control. So this is really important, timely for sure, timely on this one. And we're working as hard as we can to advance these, both of these solutions uh, to market as quickly as we can. And, and again, we're very thankful for the, the collaboration with the Gates Foundation, their superb uh, uh, collaborators and, and supporters. Next, and we're almost done. Um, we're gonna zip through the, the ag stuff because much of it um, uh, relates. There's um, the fall army worm uh, workup. Um, very devastating for those who are not tracking food security issues or pest control matters in the food space. This is a devastating pest and one of the, the most devastating on corn worldwide, and it is spreading. And um, if you just crack open Google News and you type in fall army worm, you'll see that every single day in every time zone, um, new stories are being published about just how damaging this insect is. We're starting our efforts in Brazil. Uh, Brazil is a very large country that is, has a very advanced um, regulatory framework for biotechnologies. We have a long and very productive uh, history in Brazil. And it is also one of the big producers of corn, as you know. So we're working um, with uh, uh, an excellent partner, Bayer, um, on advancing this technology to uh, corn acres in, in Brazil. And from there, we'll, we'll expand uh, once we've we've um, demonstrated its effectiveness and um, have prepared it for scale. Next slide, please. Just quick numbers. We'll go ahead and skip through this. Um, we announced a couple of weeks ago our partnership with Bayer. We have been in a collaboration with them for a number of years um, and we were very happy to make it public. Um, and, and the reception of this news was very positive. Um, you know, Bayer is a, um, among other things, uh, a chemistry company. And um, we are really, we value our collaboration with them um, in part because we share the same kind of pursuit of sustainability, but also because we have a chance to, you know, work with an established organization that is seeking new ways um, to make its practices and products more sustainable. That's what we do and that's who we are. So for us to envision a partner that needs to uh, expand its efforts in the sustainability arena, which, which it is doing. Um, it's really fun to be a part of that, um, especially given the, the, the size and, and strength of the platform that they provide. It's, it's a partnership that gives us what we otherwise would not have, and that is the ability to project our insects onto um, a considerable uh, number of acres so that we can have a real impact globally. So we're really happy with this partnership. And next, briefly on community engagement. So this, I, I mentioned I'd share. Um, when I got here and took the seat, um, you know, it was very clear to me that uh, if we were ever going to have an impact, um, we needed to place trust at the center of everything that we do. And that is not just a glossy statement or the picture of an eagle in your coffee room, break room, you know. Um, this is something that we really live every day. For us to have impact, we have to generate trust with those we seek to serve. To do that, we have to be a trusting organization. To be a trusting organization, we have to be trustworthy inside first. We have to create a climate and culture of trust and integrity, and, and that is what we do. So as we hire people, as we uh, onboard people, as we develop people, evaluate performance, um, it is all um, done first and foremost with a set of values and principles that are available on our website. Next, please. Community engagement. Um, some of you may have seen the headlines around Florida. There's, there's oftentimes every quarter or so a, a raft of negative news headlines typically by uh, around a stunt um, um, carried out by uh, anti-GMO groups. Uh, but the truth is very different. Um, in every locale that we have worked, public uh, acceptance has been exceptionally high, greater than virtually any um, political candidate that I know of, maybe with the exception of uh, Putin or some others like him. 
Um, these are incredible numbers and um, it speaks to both the real need uh, in communities for new solutions, uh, but also how we approach these communities that we seek to serve. And that is through a lens of partnership uh, and empowerment uh, so that they indeed play a part of, of the effort uh, that we're about to undertake on their behalf. This is really important. Most people don't know this about us. And uh, while we talk a lot about it, um, many news outlets love to pick up the more juicy uh, headlines relating to Jurassic Park um, and other things that are really unfortunate because it, it casts our technology as, um, you know, in a battle between, um, you know, uh, those who, who really um, are, are concerned about its impact on health and, and then scientists. And um, we just think that's the wrong narrative. It's the wrong framing. Um, and, you know, 15 years of regulatory approvals and, um, and publications suggest that this is about the most well-studied vector control uh, or insect control technology on the planet ever. Um, so we'll, I just like talking about this because when we go down, and I was in the communities last week in Brazil, in fact, uh, outside of Sao Paulo that we're serving, uh, just an incredibly warm reception relating to this technology and, and how we go about deploying it. Okay. Um, next slide. This is one of my favorites. This image right here, this girl, I, I wish we could have caught her on camera, on video camera, but right there in the middle, um, that level of amazement and wonder about what science can do for us. Um, you know, we're not embarrassed or ashamed of being uh, deep in science, uh, but we certainly would be ashamed if we're not figuring out how to speak a language and how to communicate um, the benefits and, 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 you know, nature of our technology to communities that deserve this technology, in fact, that, that need it. So love that shot. Um, and that, again, was also at a community engagement event um, in Brazil. Next slide. We don't get any of this done without wonderful people. Uh, we're a majority female organization. The leadership team is majority female. Um, but 15 nationalities is really great. It, we, we have a, a wonderful diversity of opinions, of approaches. Um, and all of that uh, comes together in a, in a wonderful team that's focused on building trust internally and externally and de developing really badass science uh, to take care of these major challenges. Okay, so, and then finally, this last slide is, um, gives you uh, information. Um, this is the, uh, I took this photo in Northern Uganda um, a little while ago, but um, if you have questions beyond this, you can email them at info at oxytech.com. You can also email me directly, my first name, G-R-E-Y at oxytech.com. I try to respond to every email I do get that doesn't exclude expletives. Um, but our website really is, is uh, becoming an increasingly um, valuable source of information you know, on, an, on a daily basis. We continue to update it with, with everything that we can pertinent to our relationship with you and, and everybody that's interested in this technology. Okay, Casper, how was that? Did we fit uh, the bill? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, you can hear me okay, right? My sounds good? Yeah. Um, yeah, so you see we have a number of questions in Q&A and th these types of uh, questions are, are some you're probably very familiar with from your, your time uh, developing these technologies. I have a number of questions myself. Um, if, if there's any that you skim through, I mean, I, I think the first one here, which is about uh, ecosystem consequences, right? So you have, uh, you're talking about uh, eliminating, this is from Divya Chander, I can read the question out. I'm not uh, fond of many insects, but what are the negative ecosystem consequences of wiping out certain groups of insects? Don't they form the base of the food pyramid for other species? And then there's a second question, uh, what happens if edited genes get into the environmental gene pool? So, I mean, I can think of, you're, you're, you're here as the expert, what, what would you say to that? Well, um, certain mosquitoes or, or agricultural pests do indeed um, make up part of the food pyramid, uh, but we're not, we're not chasing those insects. We're chasing invasive species. Um, so in the case of our mosquito, Aedes aegypti, that is a mosquito in Florida, for example, it is not native to Florida. Uh, it is not native to most places around the world and thus, um, everywhere we pursue it, it is not supposed to be there. Not to mention the fact that Aedes aegypti has spread very rapidly, so it hasn't had a chance um, to embed itself uh, as an essential element to the ecosystem. And this is well documented, and, um, and that's part one. Part two, 
what happens if edited genes get into the environmental gene pool? <clears throat> ours is a self-limiting technology. So our self-limiting gene does not progress um, by design. It will appear out in the environment. Um, if the question is about gene introgression, so um, you know, background gene introgression as our insects mate and certain males survive, then the answer um, goes back to <clears throat> how we uh, develop these insects in the first place. And that is by using um, clean background genetics from uh, known colonies that give us the, the ability to demonstrate that um, the genes we use are susceptible to insecticides uh, versus not. And in that case, um, th there is a benefit. There was a recent paper uh, done by a professor at Yale, quite controversial, uh, published about this time last year. Um, and uh, ultimately, scientific reports and Nature uh, put a very large disclaimer on the paper. And six of the 10 authors withdrew their support for the paper. Um, notwithstanding, the data was very interesting. And, and he uh, attempted to plot what happens to our introgressed genes in the environment. Um, and we love the data. We just don't like the extrapolated uh, commentary or inflammatory comments in that paper. Yeah, so uh, again, I have questions at the, about this from all angles. And if you happen to uh, check the Q&A yourself, you, you mentioned you're obviously quite familiar with Zoom. So if, if you see anything in there that you see uh, that you'd like to answer. I, I will um, say, I'll just start by saying there is one person on here that has submitted a number of questions and she follows us around to most of our speaking events. So a number of these questions, I can certainly touch on the topics she brings up. Um, okay. But you know, please stop lying. Do we think we're not paying attention? These are folks that meet us um, uh, mm -hmm. in Florida and, and create some of the issues. So let me just scan briefly. How frequently does self-limitation fail because the pest switches to an alternative host? Um, pest being the, the disease-causing organism, I guess. I, I think so. So we haven't seen that. So in the case of um, us eliminating <clears throat> or, or suppressing Aedes aegypti in a certain environment, um, it does not mean that other mosquitoes uh, become more competent vectors of dengue, for example. That, that's not happening. We haven't seen that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in, in some of the elements embedded in that question, but um, as it relates to our work, that, that's, not a, that's not an issue. Um, um, CDP? I'm oh, sorry, you want me to I can knock some of these no, out? No, 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 you, you, yeah, you, yeah. you got it. Megan, Megan, thank you. If you're out there, appreciate all the questions. Glad you're spending time with us. Um, the US CDC and Oxitec have a great relationship. Um, it, it sh her question is, we understood that no public health regulatory agencies were consulted prior to EPA approval. So that's wrong in two cases. One is, as you can find on the FDA's own website, the FDA did an exhaustive review of our first generation mosquito technology. So that's for all to see. <clears throat> And then as we move to the EPA for this uh, more recent approval, um, the CDC participated in a review, uh, in the EPA's review. Um, and in particular, they published uh, on the EPA's website, also can be read there, um, their findings relating to gene introgression in our technology. Um, so we are very happy that uh, both EPA and CDC were part of the EPA's risk assessment process. Um, and Greg, just to note, I've shared a link to that in the in the chat, and I'll be including an, an additional link in a moment um, about the CDC's collaboration in our project. Wonderful. Great. She also asked, how did Oxitec coordinate with public health agencies? Um, again, I'm not, that has not happened along the way. So we're not interfacing with the Centers for Disease Control as it relates to the formal risk assessment that was already undertaken by the EPA. The EPA reached out to the CDC specifically um, and worked together confidentially um, uh, for the review of our, of our application. So I'm not sure what that, I'm not sure what the question refers to except to say that we're happy the CDC participated. Um, another question by Linda, what is the environmental impact AEG to bird populations of eliminating or profoundly diminishing the mosquito population? Great, great question. So in um, the case of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, um, as again, we've talked about the, the Florida trial upcoming, um, there is no environmental impact to bird populations. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about two branches of effect environmentally. 
One is as part of our, as part of a local ecosystem food chain, as mentioned, uh, our mosquitoes and, and their genes do not pose a threat. So if a frog, a bat, a bird, a deer, a fish, uh, eats one of our mosquitoes, nothing happens. And we've studied this exhaustively. And all of that um, can be summarized very well in the EPA documents um, that they have published, likewise in, in peer-reviewed publications. So in essence, the, the genes we're working with are safe to begin with. And the small uh, change we make to our male mosquitoes um, does not present any threat to any living organism. And again, the EPA required us to to demonstrate that, to prove that, and we have done so to their satisfaction. Um, observable pattern of materially misrepresenting products at all. This is from Megan again. Um, I don't really know what that means. Um, not 15 years of regulatory approvals in the US. Thank you, Megan. I'm not sure I said that we have 15 years of regulatory approvals in the US. We certainly don't. That is, that is absolutely correct. We don't have that. But we have been doing uh, work with regulators in the US since 2006. So I don't know how many years that is, but we certainly have been active in that time frame. Please stop lying. Do you think we are, aren't paying attention? Pressaging is guilty of the same pattern of lies and is under litigation for a class action suit. Pressaging is no longer our owner um, as of last year and sorry, earlier this year. So, um, and, I'm, and I'm not lying. Um, Okay, let's move on to some substantive questions. Um, can you apply your technology to tree destroying beetles, bark beetles causing devastation in conifer forests? Joel, thank you for that question. That is a great question. We have been asked this a number of times. We have not had occasion to really dig into this topic um, in part because um, we aren't sure if our technology would be sustainable for the, the pattern or behavior of the bark beetle. So our, our technology really is scalable and sustainable when it comes to uh, high density um, uh, local populations. And when we start having to spread out over hundreds and thousands or millions of acres to chase these pests, which are tough, um, it might become uh, more difficult. So again, we haven't really explored in depth. Could we make a self-limiting bark beetle? I don't know um, if the insect biology would allow us to. We'd love to do so. We would just have to have a good, uh, a good, uh, you know, sustainable um, approach to it. And I'm not certain we've, we've gotten there yet. Gino, um, can you give an example, ideally with a control, of deployment of your mosquitoes that shows a decrease in the prevalence of human disease, not just a decrease in the mosquito population? Great question, Gino. No, the answer is we cannot. Uh, we have not linked any performance um, in, in our past with a specific um, health outcome as a direct uh, relation. However, uh, others have done that for us. Uh, the city of Parasacaba published their own study that highlighted a 91% reduction in dengue over the period um, of our, uh, during the period of our releases as compared to areas within which we did not release. I wouldn't call that a peer reviewed publication. And therefore that's why I said we, we have yet to show um, from an epidemiological standpoint um, that if we release our mosquitoes, um, we, can, we can reduce dengue. Now this is something that we're pursuing with lots of other organizations. Um, and you know, you might be familiar with the World Health Organization's um, requirements for listing products as approved for certain um, disease control efforts. This is a great ongoing discussion with companies like ours. We know how to kill mosquitoes. Um, so then how do we best uh, demonstrate effectiveness in the reduction of disease? Most governments are sophisticated enough to know that uh, if you suppress a disease vector, uh, the chances of um, a reduced uh, disease prevalence or transmission rates um, is reduced, thankfully. John says, hello, do you have any development programs for USA tick-based disease, such as Lyme disease? Also something we, we have been asked, thank you, John. Um, no, we don't have any um, uh, ticks relating to Lyme disease or vectors of Lyme disease in development. Um, we had a few inbound inquiries as to whether or not we'd be willing to develop one of these. Again, this particular tick uh, that transmits Lyme disease is a tough one from a geographic standpoint to target. The overflooding rates in the right locations would make it um, pretty expensive and I'm not certain our technology is the best suited for it. 
despite the fact that um, Lyme disease, of course, is exceptionally troubling. David, um, what do you think about Wolbachia approach to Aedes aegypti control? Thank you, David. Um, we have a lot of friends over in the Wolbachia camps. So there's at least two of them. Um, and I think that um, the Wolbachia that is most analogous to us, which is a suppression technique, um, offers some real benefits. Um, we're really, really impressed with the work that uh, our colleagues are doing. Um, we've branched off. Um, so our technology allows us to scale very, uh, to, to significant levels in a, an economic fashion. And that's because we are a male selecting uh, technology. So we can pr mass produce uh, mosquitoes not having to worry about sex sorting. And uh, the Wolbachia teams still do have to manage uh, a level of sex sorting, which makes it very difficult to uh, envision scales, uh, scaled up deployments. Still, I think there's a lot of promise for Wolbachia and um, I, I really enjoy our interactions with the, the, the teams there. Um, and it's, it's great, we have conversations routinely. I'll just do a couple more uh, and then I'll be happy to, to pass it back to you. Uh, Casper, um, have you tested whether your engineered males are equally successful in mating as wild type? Do you compensate for any decrease by increasing the numbers released? Great question. David knows what he's talking about. Um, so yes, so we do mating competitiveness studies and, um, and we do that in labs and we do that in the wild. Um, in labs, um, mating competitiveness is about the same, but we also know that that's not always a, a great proxy for real world you know, busy, crowded street, uh, pollution, hot, heat, whatever. Um, so we, we measure much of our performance by using uh, over flooding ratios uh, and a few other uh, measurements that help us understand how effective our male mosquitoes are in the, in the real world environment. Um, and so sometimes we do have to compensate and, and sometimes we don't, depending on a number of factors. Uh, are you working in China? Not yet. What is your method of trust building in science with local communities? Uh, so important right now with the anti-vaxxer movement. Fully agree. A few of the, the questions that were asked earlier by a certain individual are contributing to the anti-vaxxer type challenge that we face. Uh, and that is a complete disregard for facts and, and science. Um, and a willingness to fan the flames of fear and anxiety um, that, that people can adopt around these types of technologies because they're new. And as I mentioned before, much of our work focuses on how we engage with stakeholders with whom we engage um, and how we communicate the effect, you know, how we communicate our science and how we build an actual lasting authentic relationship. And we've done that successfully in every place we've gone, despite the Florida Keys um, uh, Environmental Coalition, uh, of which um, one of our participants here tonight is, is a part, we have an incredible level of support. And in fact, that's on record in the 2016 election, for the first ever uh, time a, a GM technology has been placed on a ballot. Um, and a majority of residents in the Florida Keys were in support of the deployment of our technology. Um, so we're, 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 we use a range of methods, but it starts with being authentic and open as I am being here with you right now. Um, we're not hiding behind um, a question wall. We're, we're answering or directly engaging in these types of discussions. And we would do the same thing if we were sitting in a town hall meeting uh, in, in Diatuba, Brazil, uh, as we were last week. Great, this has been a, such an interesting talk and I know you uh, we're going to close it out at the top of the hour. Um, for the participants, uh, we are recording this and we'll be uh, posting the video when it's processed. Uh, a final question um, for you, do you have any advice for entrepreneurs who, I mean, like you're, yeah, I'm asking you to welcome your competition, right? But say you're, there are startups out there who are developing these types of technologies that share features of what you're doing. Uh, which are that they're for social benefit, they face this kind of um, potential opposition, they're using advanced technology that it's hard to get your head around sometimes. Um, what advice would you have for them if you could distill it down to, to one, one idea? Mm. Uh, uh, that's a great question. So I would probably start with 
recognizing that the technology is only half the story. It's only half the story. And, and a lot of us get so enamored with our own innovations that we forget about the other half of the story. And that is um, how these technologies ultimately um, are, are accepted. And we were guilty of that for the first number of years at Oxitech. And uh, we, we have a very different view now. And um, so for those of you developing stellar next-gen technologies, um, make sure you have an authentic connection to the purpose of your technology. Make sure you have an authentic commitment to communicating the potential benefits of your technology without oversizing or outsizing them. Um, it would be great if you lay down a track record of publications um, and regulatory approvals like we have. It's hard. Um, fourth, you better uh, sensitize your investors to the long road. And if you want to you know, screenshot one of my slides earlier, this stuff takes a long, long time. And I think that the more sober each of us are about how long and how complicated a road um, these technologies face, um, the, the more earnest we can be with those important stakeholders who help enable this type of, of, of technology to come to fruition, largely on the, on the investor side. We all owe very smart investors um, an appropriate and uh, um, as accurate as possible view to what we know and what we don't know. And sometimes in the early stages, there's more we don't know, and thus that means time and that means costs. So it's a quick random set of thoughts, but I think an organic, authentic connection to the purpose, recognizing your technology is half the story, being clear and sober about timelines, and raising smart money that's willing to be patient uh, certainly are prerequisites in my mind. Mm -hmm. Do you have time for a follow-up question sure. or do you need to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on topic of raising that money. So it was, it's interesting to see that you at Occitech have got both partnerships, uh, lar large partnerships, say with Bayer and, and foundational support from uh, Gates. Um, do you have any thoughts on the fundraising? We had a speaker recently who was uh, very passionate about antibiotics where there's a clear need from society, but investors are very bulky because of certain market barriers. Um, is, do you have any thoughts regarding fundraising when you have that long uncertain path for, for a, a radical or you know, transformative technology? Mm. Well, a uh, couple of quick thoughts. We, we entrepreneurs, those who are trying to develop new things, oftentimes well before revenues or profitability would be established, uh, we need to be talking to the right investors. I think that's very important. We benefit from having uh, a very patient uh, investor um, who is a full partner in our journey to have impact uh, over time, right? So there isn't an immediate demand for um, the types of things that shorter term investors might, might demand. Second, that, that was an easy one. So I recognize that was a bit fluffy. Um, second is, um, I think in my experience, um, authenticity really matters. And I think that is uh, what I have seen in, in a number of, of groups that have come through you know, to us or, or have, have asked me to, to engage or speak. Um, folks get really tied up in their own tech and then it's all about how to justify uh, the technology's greatness rather than justifying um, the fact that the technology has potential for greatness. Um, but by the way, has an important set of benchmarks that we must hit to get there. It's rare, strangely, for people to walk into a share, you know, potential shareholder um, without a sense of, you know, without a set of disciplined and clear benchmarks that we would commit ourselves and hold ourselves accountable to. That's rare. And, and you know, <laughs> I, I know the culture in, in, uh, in the Bay Area very well um, and in any other investing capital. Um, I think we all do ourselves a favor, especially in the life sciences, is, is say, look, here is, here's what we hope to do impact-wise. We want to save, you know, 8 billion lives. Hey, we want, um, we think our technology has a great promise. It, it's got, you know, it, it's got the moat, it's got blue, blue ocean, whichever terminology you want to use. Oh, but by the way, we're not completely uh, drunk on the spirits of our own technology drink. Here are seven key milestones that we will attempt to accomplish in the next 24 months, let alone 20 years. 24 months, please hold us accountable to these um, successive number of 
increasingly complex milestones to hit. I think that would be great. And so that, that kind of authenticity represents both the promise or the aspiration of the technology, but highlights also the discipline that the founders or the innovators have uh, to hold themselves accountable before anybody else does. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Gray. It's uh, been such an interesting talk. And once again, this will be recorded and, uh, and posted on both your website and, and ours um, via YouTube. Thanks a lot and uh, have a great rest of your day in Oxford.